Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 188. This episode is with the delightful Claire Roy Harvey. She is a puppeteer who's worked on so many of our favorite things, and she was a joy to hang out with. In this episode, we talk about how she got into puppetry, teaching herself to make her own puppets, the inspiration behind her show Lily Through the Dark, what it was like working on multiple Star Wars movies, Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance, and Jurassic World Dominion, the importance of being open to learning new things, and so much more. She quickly became one of my new favorite people, and I'm so excited for you to get to know her as well. She's the best. So, without further ado, let's just jump into it. Please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 188, with Claire Roy Harvey. Theme song time. This is the world now. How you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Good. I'm, good. Uh, I'm at home in England on the, on the South Coast. Amazing. Amazing. Are you from there, the South Coast of England? No, I'm not. I'm from um I'm from Essex, which is like up a bit more by London. I'm familiar with the accent. It's a popular ah, one. <laughs> ah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it seems to be a little bit kind of Dare I say it, it seems to be a little bit cool uh, yeah. <laughs> now, which I never thought would be something that would ever happen. So that's kind of nice. Take it as the wheel turns wherever you can. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Yeah, I'm taking it. I'm saying I'm cool at the start of this. Yeah, there you go. I'll say it for you. We'll, we'll, this is a double team effort here. <laughs> How's your day going? Because you're in the future for me. Yes, of course. Yeah, what time is it there? It is 2 p.m. You're at 7 I can tell you from the future, everything's okay. It's fine. Thank God. You know, that's actually the reason I wanted to talk to you, just in case, <laughs> to have an agent, you know? <laughs> that's why we're here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't mind being your time lord. That's okay. Good. Good. I need one. I keep going through them. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but, wow, that makes me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> it's no fault of my own. You guys just get all sure, weird with sure. your time. You sure, know, sure. I have to, have to abjugate any sort of fault for legal reasons. Gotcha. It's a disclaimer. Exactly, exactly. So I, I've never been to Essex. How, what, what is it like comparatively to other parts of England? Give me a frame of reference here. Well, where I'm from is kind of, it's just outskirts, really. It's sort of on mm. more on the London side. Um, and it was actually a little bit of history. It yeah, was uh, built as an overflow town from the Second World War. So people were like moving out. Oh. Um, so all around the edge of London, you get these like, little towns they're sort of called new towns love it um and where i'm from there was like a, a, an unusual design i think so there was um like you have the town center where you got your shops and stuff then you have the residential it's sort of kind of comes out in a circle and then you have like what's called green belt land which is all this kind of green land that can't be touched um oh. yeah so it was quite it's you know a nice bit of interesting that sounds nice yeah yeah it's cool it's cool mixture of like you know sort of more rural sort of green spaces yeah close enough to the city as well so it's kind of a good location <laughs> why did i ever leave look at me yeah. <laughs> around like why did i ever leave <laughs> That's interesting. I When I was in London a few years ago, I noticed that the roads of London specifically, if you drew them out, would look like a cracked windshield. Everything oh, is wow. just slightly circular as well and just going out. I'm, I'm sensing a circular theme. Yeah, that's right. such a bad omen when you're driving <laughs> for it to have been a cracked windshield. Oh, man, that's not what you want. You know, it's you guys figure out a way, though, to, to navigate them as far as roads. And it's opposite as well, because we're on the we're on the right side you guys are on the left it's, you're on the right side we're on the wrong side yeah you? yeah i mean it depends who you ask i guess <laughs> yeah, yeah i did live in london for a while actually um how'd that go i mean it was fine I, and you know i made a lot of friends there and connections and because i'm from somewhere that's sort of just on the edge of it it didn't feel like a big move mm, um sure but i went to i went and trained at university and i came down to the oh. south Coast. Why i'm here now so that was my got it that was my um and it got to a point where I wanted to come back because it's it's quite a rural sort of nice place down here. Yeah. 
um, which is, you know, compared to London, I just got to a point where I thought, hey, so it doesn't matter where I live, sort of for work, so I could, sure, I could kind of go where I wanted, which was a nice little uh, realization to have. There you go. I'm mm. I'm much more of a rural person as well. Oh, yeah. Cities are just it's it's too much. I get tired. Yeah, I need, need a little quiet, just a little bit of a recharge. Yeah. Is is there a big like entertainment sort of thing coming out of Essex? Is there a big entertainment thing coming out? Of like where that where that sort of interest come from? Um, oh. for me. Yeah. Um. So I. That's a very good question. So I, uh, I was a pretty shy child, actually. So sometimes I do think, how I ended up doing what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, if you pick it apart, I mean, I hide behind stuff for a living. So. Oh, I respect that. Yeah, it kind of works, you know. So you're looking at the thing I'm yeah. doing, not necessarily at me. So I guess. If you unpick it like that, the psychology of that, that's quite interesting, you know? Interesting. Yeah, okay. yeah, I kind of yeah. like that. You're like the, the, you're the guts of the whole thing. You're the heart yeah. and the spirit, you know? Yeah, I yeah. Like um, but I did actually, so yeah, I did, uh, I went and did like performance courses. Makes sense. Um, which I look back now and think, gosh, well done, little shy child. Well yeah. done. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't really look like it was going to be on the cards for you, you know, personality wise. Sure. Um, but I'm grateful I did because I probably wouldn't be doing the job I'm doing now. Sure. But um, it's funny how those things work out. Hey? It's my favorite thing to connect those dots. Be like, oh, mm. interesting. So then where did puppetry come from? Because it's such a specific skill and it is, it's different, but it's also the same because it is performing, but it's it's yeah, a different yeah. avenue. Yeah, yeah. It's just a different way of, channeling that character or showing that character yeah. to the world or telling their story. Um, so I I met a puppeteer. Great start. <laughs> when I was, yeah, <laughs> when I was 16. Oh, um, awesome. Yeah, and I, I think until you meet someone doing the job when you're a young person, you have no idea that it even exists. 100%. Um, so that was a real kind of formative moment, I think, where I thought, hey, Someone's make a career out of this. This is cool. Yeah. Um, I lived opposite a theatre, um, and it was a real kind of little fairy tale. Like I could look out the window and sort of see the bright lights of the theatre. Oh, cool. Claire Harvey sitting in yeah. her room, looking out, longing at the theatre. And uh, I got involved with um, the youth service where I lived, and they were doing a lot of things to essentially stop kids hanging out getting drunk on park benches sure (laughs) (laughs) i I guess i got scooped off a park bench at some point some amazing adults who thought our time could be spent a little bit better sure (laughs) (laughs) um and one of the things they used to do um alongside stuff like you know getting young people to take an interest in politics and their you know local council and activism and stuff like that the other things we used to do were they'd sort of see who's interested in putting on shows oh yeah um so I got involved in that with my one of my sisters um and then met another friend whose mother ran a youth theater um Mm -hmm. at this same venue and they used to do the largest community pantomime in the UK wow Uh, yeah yeah it's it's a pretty big deal you know it's just yeah that's cool luck that I even lived there you know I love it um and then I met, so I saw that in the panto there were puppets. And I remember thinking, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, because my mum uh, was, and still is, in fact, really handy and, like, innovative with making things. She I was, can see the thread. Yeah, she was a designer and a window dresser for a company called Woolworths years and years ago. And mm-hmm. she used to go around, like, designing the windows and doing the window dressing stuff. Wow. So that was something that's, like passed down to to me you know that yeah kind of, again that's quite a, a formative beat I can see my, it yeah in my work life um and so I look, see these puppets and think oh, okay that's cool that could be something that could be made um and so me and a friend uh started making some puppets based on that wow um, yeah yeah so just sort of got stuck in really I'm really from a household where if you want to do something or if something's broken or if something he's doing, you just kind of get on with it. Like, yeah. You know, you just have a go. It's that sort of have a go attitude and not being afraid to try something hard. 
just because yeah. it's hard doesn't mean you can't do it you know totally um, so yeah so that was kind of the vague beginnings of puppetry being planted in my world but I think at the time I still thought I might go into musical theatre okay okay why not have a go yeah yeah well that was sort of what the youth theatres were doing um that I was involved in um they just give you a song and off you go yeah um, <laughs> um and through school I did a bit of choir as well and I sort of found out that I could sing a bit um a little bit great. I yeah, may have yeah. heard some of your stuff. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. Oh, maybe, maybe <laughs> doing your research. Um, so, yeah, so that was kind of interest as well. And I think because some of the first stuff I saw on stage was musical theatre, I kind of just thought that was theatre probably. Sure. Um, that makes that, sense. Yeah. And that was sort of a tangible thing to do. So I kind of started gathering these threads of like, Oh, there's some puppets, maybe. There's some singing kind of going on as well. I did a bit of dance as well. So there was definitely kind of a, hey, maybe I could do this for my career. Um, and my family were really supportive of that as well, which cool. I think um, is really great, you know. like Yeah, like, huge like, difference. Yeah, I mean, they, they didn't understand it, and they often don't. Yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to. You just got to yeah, support exactly. it. <laughs> exactly, but as long as they're happy for you, then that's the yeah. main thing. <laughs> when you come home with like this crazy idea that you're going to go off and leave home and, and go study and get yourself into loads of debt when you're a teenager. Right. <laughs> and they go, okay, good luck. As oh. long as you're happy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> weeping at the door. Oh, yeah. why are you doing this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Put the puppets down. Get yeah. Yeah, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, they were super supportive of it. And I think they thought I probably was going to go into music of some sort, really. Sure. Um because that seemed like an obvious route at a point. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something I still do sort of as, as and when I can. And sometimes when you get a really great job, you know, you can have all these threads sort of come together and yeah. actually you can use, you know, your musicality at the same time. And actually I'd say a lot about puppetry is to do with rhythm. Oh, interesting. Makes sense. Yeah. Movement, timing. I get yeah. it. Yeah. And even if you're not doing anything sort of specifically rhythmic, say choreography wise with a puppet, um you certainly are if you're working in a team of people because you have to kind of sit in that right. other you know and you you get that magic kind of those little shorthand beats of communication where you're yeah. reading each other and getting in that same place you know so i do think there's a, a correlation i think you're absolutely right i think there is a yeah. correlation between music and movement and puppetry because when i see creatures being multiple people inside how can there not be that sort of shorthand it's does that take time to like get usually when it's you're like their learning curve yeah i mean yeah. yeah it does i mean there's some people that like there's something naturally that you just click in with them sure. and and then other people it might take a little bit longer but i think you know if they're also a puppeteer and they also have a bit of music kind of know-how they mm -hmm. you know you can click in a bit quicker but there are definitely people who i feel like i've naturally just locked in with you know on like yeah. day one um i work a lot with a puppeteer called lynn robertson bruce i and i've ended up working with her a fair amount on sort of creatures for star wars things Amazing. and we yeah there's just a real like easy shorthand you know that got there yeah. really quickly um sure. and her background is dance so it does make you wonder yeah maybe there's something in it you know yeah there has to be one hand washes the other it's all performance but the, yeah, the musicality yeah. of it, very interesting. Yeah, I love it when the music and the puppetry stuff kind of combines. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why I really love still doing a bit of theatre. So yeah, I started working in theatre and that was sure. where I sort of found the kind of, that's where I learned how to do puppetry, really, I'd say. You know, that was my early kind of, let's work out how to actually do this. Sure. Um, and learn the thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> learn the thing first and then go and do the thing you know um and yeah that I used to well I ran a theatre company with a guy called Ed Wren who um the company used to do puppetry storytelling and mix it with live music um oh. yeah so that was kind of, again here comes music you know kind of layering up all this sort yeah of, um, to support all this storytelling um is that who you did uh Lily Through the Dark with it is yeah yeah how, that was how the, did that come to be well, uh, so when I left 
So I met Ed Wren at university mm-hmm. um, and we decided that we wanted to make shows. Cool. Um, we didn't have a theatre company. We just kind of went, <laughs> hey, let's just, as these, you know, bright young things tend to do. Sure. And hey, I'm not jaded by the industry. I'll just, <laughs> you know, pour my absolute heart and soul into this. That's what yeah. I'm supposed to do, you know. So, um, so yeah, we in the end, we started a theatre company called The River People. Um, and our second show that we did was a show called Lily Through the Dark. Um, yeah. And it was based on uh so my father passed away when I was 20 um Mm. and about we started the company maybe three years sort of later-ish or we made the show Mm -hmm. three years later-ish and it was kind of to explore sort of the feelings of grief of those people left behind you know and kind of totally try and process that a bit and I guess my outlet at the time was hey I'm making theatre and by then we'd made another show about an experience that Ed had had in his family um and we'd kind of garnered a little bit of interest in the UK um people were interested in seeing the work and we thought oh fantastic our work isn't crap you know (laughs) people like it (laughs) maybe we should carry on and so it was uh the Lily Through the Dark show that was the one that kind of meant that we went okay let's make the theatre company around the product now. Sure. Um, so, yeah, it was sort of based on the real experience that I'd had um, yeah. when my father had passed away. Um, and we took a bit of artistic licence with it, you know. Sure, of course. Um, but, I mean, <sighs> loss is such a universal language. Tell me about it. Yeah, and I yeah. just... I mean, I still have people contact me now, you know, about about the show, and so so does so do the others, you know, who were involved in it. People still talk to me about it and still say, you know, this is I, I really remember this. Um, and we actually uh, made a very small version of it for a um, a child bereavement charity. Um, oh, beautiful! We, yeah, yeah, we made like a suitcase version, so we kind of put the a miniature version of the set in a suitcase. Ed took out his mandolin, which he plays exquisitely, yeah. um, and he story told and played the mandolin. And I did most of the puppetry sort of in the case. So we went round and and uh, spoke to families and showed them the story. And we did a bit of a workshop. And it's just you know it's all that kind of stuff that it keeps the dialogue going because it's yeah. something that's universal and that so many people struggle with and will be affected by. That actually yeah. it that was kind of like yes, it was work and yes, it was theatre and. But also, it was good. It's soul work, you know that kind of thing. A hundred percent. Did it? <laughs> yeah, did yeah. it? Did you find that it helped? Like when you finished the show, like, oh, I was able to kind of get that out a little bit, express it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it yeah. was a. Uh, it's always that cathartic thing, isn't that's it? That's the word. Good, yeah. That's slightly real. You kind of go, "This is, you know, here's art helping me deal with this." But at the same time, it's starting those difficult conversations for other people as well. Yeah. Um, and it, it becomes more than just your story. It's just, it, it stops being that intimate and it becomes more right. social um, because everybody has experienced it to some extent. Um, yeah. See, that was kind of the the one, the, the show for me that kind of concreted that it's important to tell stories and that puppetry is a fantastic vehicle for doing that. Yeah, I would say so. And you won an award, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. Yeah, yeah. We want some stuff, you know. <laughs> you were on to something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we were actually in 2020, boom, going yeah. to do it. <laughs> the old, we were going to... the year. <laughs> no, yeah, before the world exploded. Yeah. Um, we were all getting together to do um, like an audiobook version of it. So maybe that would happen. Oh, yeah. please do that. Don't let that yeah. one die. <laughs> yeah, I'll try. <laughs> Yeah, that would be really nice um, with the original cast as well. Oh, be- cool. Yeah, That's yeah. amazing. I love that kind. Of, I mean, the best art comes from inside, right? It's like there's that unspoken human experience. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, here's a thing. And then someone else is like, I, I'm picking up that wavelength. I got it. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, one of the things that um, Ed and I started the company, you know, one of the reasons why we started it was to kind of try and tell in what we thought were important stories yes. and imp- 
important narratives you know and thing to look at things that aren't necessarily spoken about and something yeah. that you may not necessarily make a, a theater show about you know <laughs> uh, <laughs> but i'd argue you should <laughs> well yeah it turned out that that was great you know and, and that uh it was a real stepping stone um as well um and i had so many incredible conversations with so many people you know people the way it just opens people up when you start yeah. talking about like that is is a really special thing, I think. And for people to still feel now, you know, years later, that they can get in touch and, and you know, talk about it. I, yeah. Again, that's just really, really special, isn't it? I think so. I think mm. so. I think that's that that's that good art. You're like, mm, this, yeah. this hit the soul. You know, it's like, I enjoyed it, but also, whoa. Mm, there's a subconscious. Tasty yeah there's a you hit the subconscious here in a way well done well done yeah yeah that's pretty good um and at the time i was also making all the puppets for what we were doing as well really yeah so i oh. everything everything you heard was um ed so he would do the music and he would do the story right um and then everything you saw was what i was doing uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah it was uh it it, again, that was a real steep learning curve. You know, we were making our own art, making our own shows. And what you don't realise at the time, and we were both performing in it, but we just, at the, and at the time, you don't realise that other people are watching. Yeah, <laughs> sure. And you kind of get, so we'd run, we were, you know, we ran the company for a while. And then there was a point where, you know, it naturally comes to its end. Sure. And uh, suddenly we were being, you know, other folks that were making their work or other great theatres were asking us to work for them. Um, oh right and so you don't realize that what you're actually doing through all of this struggling as a young theater company with no money uh <laughs> making you know puppet costumes out of your own clothes <laughs> sure. you go, oh this is all kind of been <laughs> one big audition for other right. people sure but i was completely unaware of until that moment you know you sort of forget other people are watching because you know this the struggle was as they say very real when you yeah. were uh, young with kind of less money like from sure. various places um so yeah it was uh again massive learning massive massive learning and i wouldn't i wouldn't change it but um yeah, yeah. it's nice to be young, young with loads of energy making theater. right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're changing the world with our shows you know? yeah I, how many shows did you do gosh um we used to do other like like little live event things as well so i'm not 100 percent sure we used to do you know, the things that would make money as well. So like sure. uh, a, a very strange uh, situation we had was with a local venue and they used to run a club night. So we used to provide acts for them uh -huh. and I would do like, a puppet booth. It was all kind of circus themed. Sure. I would do this puppet booth where like- I uh, love it. We would make a different thing every week. And one of the ones we made was a, a fortune teller puppet. So you walk into this little tent and it's like, there's this little kind of uh, little creature sort of sat. She's going to tell your fortune. Um, That's awesome. And then yeah, it was good fun. Yeah, and we had you know little bits of business and things, and the table would float on a rig, and it was all yeah silly what? stuff. So you stuff like that, but like in terms of shows that were the bigger shows, and say maybe we did three or four, um, and you know you're touring them for a while, applying for money from Arts Council England to kind of get a big tour on the go. And sure, there was a point where we uh, with our friends from. Uh, Spinny Hollow, which is a uh, cultivated copse of woodland near us, that's run by some friends. Cool. Um, they we got some money for them to build a bow top wagon that we could take our shows out in. Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah, you can really like get out to people, you know. Yeah, you can really uh, jump in and, and get out to the communities, and you can put your show up anywhere. Is the thing, you know? Right. It's a pop up. It's a pop up, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, that was all the, again amazing learning. You know, the whole time I'm like being a sponge for puppetry and like any puppeteers I'm meeting and yeah, yeah. Are, are you good at learning? Because learning you have to be okay with not being very good at something for a little bit. Like, are you good at kind of giving yourself room to learn? I feel like I am a bit of a sponge, and I also feel that as a human being, I think it's really important to to not be scared to fail and do the thing yeah. wrong because some of the best failures that I've ever had yeah. <laughs> you, know, you, get, you, get, you learn some incredible lessons you know? sure uh, um, and you go oh hey how did that lead to this um, sure. so failure can be an amazing blessing in disguise um 
and I think as soon as for me I think I feel like as soon as I start to think oh yeah I know all of that I know all these things yeah then surely that's when everything goes wrong like everything <laughs> I do is is a new experience you know someone puts a pop it in your hand and yes it might operate the same as some one you've done before mm-hmm. but actually it's got all of its own little quirks you know it's got its own little things you're dealing with and you might be in a different it'll be a whole different set of people usually as well so then you have to kind of adjust to all of that so sure yeah I do think it's a, it's a job that keeps you on your toes for sure I bet you have to keep paying attention yeah <laughs> <laughs> and being a sponge you know I've seen you use cardboard I've seen you use ink and paper I've seen you use burlap I've, did you teach yourself to sculpt or did you have to like take classes or something because I've seen your sculpting faces of puppets too like if you touch anything it seems like you can make something out of it it's it's pretty amazing except gold i still haven't perfected not it. yet spinning. <laughs> not yet but there's still time right i'm still learning that's right. we just gotta find the right little person <laughs> yeah, and exactly. the right wheel that's it yeah that's all i need let's blame my tools yeah um uh i yeah i taught myself i didn't do any particular amazing. um I didn't do any making courses of this because they kind of weren't really around. Like puppetry courses is a thing, weren't sure. really around when I was younger. So I mostly learned from people just being really generous. Um, and I was that kid that had all the behind the scenes books. Oh, yeah. The good <laughs> that stuff. Was, that's still me, you know? Yeah, but same. Was, yeah. And you learn so much by picking things up and trying it. It's that whole trying it thing again, you know? Sure. Like, um. At university, I did a performance course, um, and that's really useful. But alongside that, in my own time, I would be making stuff. Um, cool. And so if we needed something for a show, I would just make the thing. There <laughs> you, you know, go. Work out, work out how to make the thing. You know, if something's broken, fix it. It's that sure. sort of mentality. Um, and then there's kind of specifics that, like, I once got some money from Arts Council England uh, when we were running the River People to go work with um, an amazing puppet maker called Max Humphreys. Mm-hmm. Um, and he uh, was really kind and gave us like a week sort of working in his workshop. And that was sort of the first time oh, I'd wow. ever seen someone's workshop, you know. It was, yeah. It was amazing. And he was incredibly generous. Um, and I met another puppeteer called Mandy Travis um, who helped us develop Lily through the dark she'd come and sit in rehearsals with us and kind of oh, give wow. us some point on the puppetry so like honestly Brian like uh, I just think that there's so many people that I've met that are just so kind and like really believe yeah. in paying it forward and like sending that information back down the line sure. when people need to learn. um so yeah I've just never been afraid to kind of go oh hey that's a cool material I'll just go find some of that and <laughs> have a go and then work <laughs> out like what I can use it for sure um and I, I spent a long time as part of the theatre company. One thing we also did was run workshops. Cool. Um, so we used to do performance workshops, but we'd also do, I would run making workshops as well. So craft stuff or like puppet making or design. Sure. Um, so you kind of learn, say if you've got a two hour workshop, mm-hmm. there's only a certain amount of time you could, you can, you know, spend time making something. Sure. So you try and, you backtrack so you work out what's the best outcome for this person to take away with them sure what's the strategy for for learning and teaching them how to do it mm-hmm. and you can pick a really specific you know material and teach them how to use that specific material in the workshop so again by proxy you're learning even more about it oh um, okay so yeah learning by doing i guess has been the thing and learning I like by it. yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, which is often, you know, it's that trial by fire, isn't it? Sure. You, just, you work out, do it when you have to. Right. <laughs> when the track, and you're just laying the tracks down. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's worked out so far. It's been okay. Yeah, yeah. I've got a lot of tracks. <laughs> that's right. So then when did you make the jump to screen? Because that's, again, a very different thing. There's a stage versus a screen. Mm. The medium is yeah. different. Yeah. So that was the thing that I... I think I, I knew that that's where I was headed, but mm. I just had no idea how to do that. And, you know, when you have rent to pay every day, you just do the thing that you're making money <laughs> doing. Totally. Uh, don't yep. be just. So, um, so I carry on with, you know, the theatre company stuff. And then after we finish doing that, I work. I'm re- really lucky to work for um, places like the Little Angel Theatre in London, who are an incredible Amazing. puppet theatre. Yeah. Um, so I did some shows with them. Again, 
sponging more learning off of them. Sure. Um, which is fantastic. And then I am moving out of London. I have a box in my hands, like a massive box, and my phone rings. And I'm like, oh, strange. I haven't <laughs> spoken to this person for a really long time. Okay. Let's see who let's say hello. And I pick my phone up and I hear someone say, Hello, Arv. Are you still doing puppetry? <laughs> I, thought, I know that voice. So let's rewind the story. Okay. And let's remember the puppeteer that I meet at the theatre when I'm a kid. Mm-hmm. The puppeteer I meet is a guy called Brian Herring. Ah, I'm <laughs> way familiar. Back, yeah. Way back when I'm watching the pantos um, in the theatre opposite my house. Yeah. It's him that's behind the puppetry in these pantos and actually he wow. was writing the time as part of the creative team yeah so he knew me as this shy kid you know like, what a small I, world I, singing yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh and he found out in the in the intervening years that i'd been doing puppetry you know and he'd been sort of keeping an eye on what i was doing because obviously he's pops here and yeah. you do you know the rumblings of what other people are doing um and I said, yeah, I am still doing puppetry, but I am just moving house right now. Um, <laughs> so this isn't a great time. And he said, well, I need you to send a tape. And trust me, you want to send this tape. You have to send this tape. And I said, OK, fine. Well, send me all the details. And he sent me the details. And obviously, at the time, I don't know that the project is The Force Awakens. Of course. Of course. <laughs> and you're not told these things, you know, because nope. it was you know, it's such a massive deal. Like it's all coming back and yeah, there was a lot of uh, sort of cloak and dagger situations about it. So you just get the information that you need told right. to you. Please send a tape here. You'll be, use these sides. We'll, you know, we'll send you a link to log into the sides, send a tape, done. And I thought, mm. okay, fine. But I read the sides and I thought, this mm. is interesting. This sounds like it'd be a certain franchise that, I just sure. love. Yeah. Surely not. And I hadn't heard any rumblings that anything has happened. Sure. Um so I send a tape. Um along with most of the other female puppeteers in the UK. And mm-hmm. actually some of the guys sent them too. Um and they were trying to cast this particular character, which at the time was supposed to be a puppet. Um uh we go through a casting process, so I went in one day, (laughs) brilliant day to uh, Pinewood and uh, I walk into this little waiting room just to sign in at reception. And I realized I'm stood in a room with these really tall slender men who are about seven foot. Ah. And I think, hang on a minute, mate, (laughs) what are they auditioning for? And I'm starting to piece everything together, you know, my mind is like, well, they could only be, hang on a minute, you know. Yeah. Someone needs very tall people. Anyway, I do sort of an audition process and it's really great. Actually, you get given so much support, you know, they, whatever support you need, um, test cool. your monitors and things. Um, and then it, it appears that it's a, a puppet character that's going to be mm-hmm. in Star Wars and that Star Wars is coming back, you know, we're doing Force Awakens. Great. So I'm trying to stay chill because I am, a <laughs> bit, like, <laughs> you know, like you're just trying not to sweat. Right. Yeah. This is fine. Right. Yeah, yeah. This is just another normal day. I do this another all the normal... time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and, and then uh, I walk into an audition finally, and uh, there's another guy that's reading the part opposite. And uh, he says, hi, my name's Derek. And I said, oh, hi, nice to ah. meet you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is where I meet uh, Derek Arnold, who's also another fantastic uh, member of the um, CFX gang uh, mm-hmm. from from star wars um so it was a bit of a trial by fire for me to be honest sure um another one yeah <laughs> par for the course at this point <laughs> exactly yeah we you know we just get on with it and we learn yeah um and i didn't guess it um oh. the character went a different way sure um the character became digital um and that was that um but i got a phone call saying uh, was i available for something else and how tall was i um, and I now realise years later that that was for the caretakers. Oh, um, okay. But I wasn't available. I was signed on to a theatre tour by that point, so I couldn't sure. just leave it. Yeah. Um, but then 
I get a call now what was that about so I get a call for solo so some time passes I get a call was it solo no I get a call for last Jedi uh-huh that sounds about um right. yeah yeah yes and I uh, that was that was before yes yeah <laughs> we do <laughs> the math the wait a minute. yes yeah. seven rogue I, one eight exactly. solo nine I got, got you <laughs> um yeah I get a call for last Jedi and um they just needed an extra member of the team to go to Dubrovnik um mm -hmm. and shoot uh there's a sauna sequence in the yep. last Jedi where uh -huh. all the, the uh creatures bundle through there was a, it ended right. up being um it wasn't in the movie in the end it was just in the sort of deleted scenes yep um but I was under a big like slug creature with amazing um, it was, it was amazing, actually, yeah. But it's one of those moments where you walk in and go, yeah, this is cool. This is just another day. I can handle yeah, this. This checks out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is fine. Uh, and I was under there with some fantastic people, actually. I was under there with Ollie Taylor, uh, Steve Kinnan, uh Robin Guyver. Oh, love him. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, uh, Kieran Shah. Amazing. Um, and Ali Sarabani was there as well. And, you know, we're just, you know, in Dubrovnik with a big slug creature. Yeah, as you do. You know? Just, you know, that's the day. Um, so, yeah, you learn. And again, you learn a lot really quickly. Yeah. Almost. And then, yeah, I got a call for solo after that. So I think that went well. Um, I would say so. <laughs> <laughs> and, but in solo, it was for um, so this is a big scene with Mother Proxima mm -hmm. in the water. Amazing. Uh, and the first con like uh, idea for it, the first concept was um, a load of puppeteers, puppeteering tentacles. So originally she had lots of tentacles. Um, oh, so we, okay. we, um, but it wasn't using it and they changed the, the design of her. Sure. Uh, and they didn't need it. Um, but yeah, a load of us went in and shot all that. Um, so yeah, and that was okay. And then ended up doing Rio uh -huh. with um, Katie. Katie and Lynn Robertson. Another Bruce. previous guest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another previous guest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it just slowly, you slowly start to, you know, you do something good, it's okay. And then you sort of carry on and you're learning more and more and more as you go. Sure. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of. How was that doing extra arms on a person? Were they attached to her? Yeah, they're attached to the suit. Yeah, yeah. So you talk so about they... moving together. You're doing arms while she's bouncing around as well. Hey, we're back in the rhythm again, you know. There we go. Yeah, and there was there were points where both Lynn and I were in. So sometimes I was in just because I seemed to be the correct next human up, you know, like those sure. Russian up. Yeah. <laughs> I to be the size up. So there's moments <laughs> where I was in both arms in the back of Katie, and then there are moments where uh, Lynn was in one side, I was in the other, depending on what what the character was oh. doing. Oh. Um. So yeah, there was lots of um, lots of chopping vegetables and throwing frying pans and trying stuff out. The R and D stuff for it was great fun. Oh, I bet. Um, yeah, that's cool. So, yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah, that was fun. You just do a bit and then a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Sure. Were Were you also the alien in the jar that was singing? Yeah. I was. <laughs> yeah. I was. Yeah. How, how How did that work? Uh, it's such good fun. So the builders. I mean, big shout out to all the builders and all the fabricators. Oh, yeah. And everyone that works in those teams, because the work, you know, I walk in to be shown a puppet <laughs> and sometimes they go, oh, yeah, here's the puppet. So there's this that's kind of we've got to work this out, we've got to work this out. And I just think I could peel my face off with joy at how incredible <laughs> it is, you know. <laughs> it's just unreal. Everyone's working at the, it's like the apex of somebody's art. Yeah. Um, so it's just such a privilege to be able to kind of add something to them, and you know. Sure put the little cherry on the top like um and you're just another cog in that kind of line of right of its creation it's just a lovely thing to be a part of but um yeah so that was actually in water oh yeah oh. yeah so it was the little tank as you see it uh -huh. and then the puppet was sort of hung inside and then it was filled up with water and around the back it's a really genius system um that uh there was a glove in the back like a, a rubber glove and i put my arm into the glove into the puppet what and then it was like a hand puppet yeah it's a hand puppet yeah 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 that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> I had no it idea awesome. yeah yeah and then the rig also moves up and down so it looks like it's floating so it's on like scaffolds that kind of go inside one another um and damien farrell was sort of doing that oh, so that it looks like it's kind of uh floating that was the first i think that was the first thing i did with Damien actually um wow. and then uh over the course of the shoot I think people that were on the eyes were 
Neil Sterenberg was there on the eyes. Lynn Robertson Bruce again did some mm-hmm. eyes, and Brian Herring did some eyes. So you know, it's all that kind of team. Sure. Team. But, you know. but yeah, he's an incredible build. Sam, uh, Sam Nicholson, I think his name is. Yeah, um, built the the puppet, and it was such a joy to use. And and the fans have really jumped on oh, yeah. him. Like <laughs> when he first came out, I remember seeing people sort of posting such joy about it <laughs> oh yeah i mean look at him and he sings he's gorgeous. <laughs> so gorgeous yeah 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 and he sings and hello there's me doing some proper juice there it is singing. again look yeah. at this look at it all these lovely. things we're finding <laughs> yeah yeah but um and we had the track you know we took puppeted to the track and oh cool originally the vocal was a little bit different um sure and it was it was different to in the movie mm-hmm. um but yeah that was a. Uh, that was a sort of a fun, unexpected one to do as well. So again, another little thing, like just, you know. Yeah, keep on trucking. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you learn so much, you know. That was my first sort of puppet on my own, I think. Uh, cool. For, for Star Wars. So I remember thinking, as they brought the camera over, I remember thinking, oh, okay. <laughs> Water off a duck back. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, don't mess this up. <laughs> I love the idea because I'm like imagining you puppeteering all these different things, and it's there's a lot of angles, right? Like you're on stage, you're facing out the audience, you're behind a puppet doing this, you're under a table doing this, and then in Dark Crystal is one of those <laughs> sets where it's up and you're running through the puppeteer lanes. Like how yeah. how is how was that? Because that's that's a Henson yeah. thing. It's a big deal. Yeah, so that was all raised sets, um, and that was, I mean. <sighs> how long have we waited for more dark crystal you know right. so that was incredible you walk on to it's the kind of job where and actually a lot of these jobs are that i find i'm asked to go and do you walk in and you just think don't cry it's so brilliant but don't cry yeah yeah <laughs> wait till amazing. no one's looking <laughs> yes yeah find a quiet moment and go and yeah. cry and then come. um but yeah that was um and again people working at the absolute top of their art forms oh yeah People that make the books, you know, that the puppets are holding, like just so. Oh, it's and like just, real books, not like just a cover. Real books, like, having commissioning all these things, you know, to have that level of detail yeah. is stunning. Um, but before I did Dark Crystal, I did a um, a uh, children's TV series um, oh, cool. for the BBC um, called Feeling Better. And I used that time just to brush up on my. Um, on my straight scan monitor um because oh. up until then i'd done all reverse scan which is like the mirror image oh um, yeah so you're looking at your monitor and you've got the mirror image so it's you kind of the screen Ooh. is back your brain is but, well that's straight scan so you switch it and that's what the camera sees and that's how the production worked everyone was on straight scan Ooh. so i took the time to on that job to teach myself straight scan and i'm very glad i did smart <laughs> smart you don't want to be you the one. It, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, yeah, you don't want to be that leaning puppet in the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think there's a derogatory term in the puppeteer, like puppet community of like, don't be a leaning puppet. Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to coin that now. I'll coin that. No one wants to be a leaning puppet. Yeah, no. Oh, God. Just don't don't be a leaning puppet, right? It's yeah, the worst no thing. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, Dark Crystal was something else. I was again another lucky one. I ended up doing sort of a lot of different things on that. Um, cool. I was working mostly with um, a puppeteer called a fantastic puppeteer actually called Helena Clark Smee. Yeah. Um, who name you might have heard of before. She was the collector Skexis, and she Ooh. she Ooh. was seller as well. Um, amongst lots of other things, you know, the whole core team did sort of covered most of the things, and we would right. jump in of assist but I was really lucky that I got to work with her pretty much the entire time up close um oh, cool yeah and I was assisting her in the Skeksis so we had like the the nose pump for all the goo and like Ugh. so that, that was fun uh, <laughs> and then <laughs> seeing her doing the super intense Oscar winning stuff yeah with Celad- was just amazing you know I was doing her arms or whatever else she needed um at that point um yeah again something really special to see up close and to see that whole core team actually delivering incredible stuff and like the I mean yeah there's just so much 
so much good stuff in there that really pushed puppetry. Um, and another great thing about it was that they managed to include uh, Law, who was like a giant rod puppet, giant Bumraku puppet. Right. Puppeted by Damien which was apparently one of the original ideas that Jim Henson wanted to have in the oh. first movie. Yeah, so I did a bit of digging. I read an article about it. And um, gosh, this is way back on, on the show. And um, the technology at the time just wasn't there because sure. a lot of the tech this time was used to take us out. Um oh. And that's what happened with the law stuff. Um, so they're able to have that sort of rod puppet. Just having yeah. all of the different types of puppetry was phenomenal anyway. Yeah. But to have a giant rod puppet on the set um, just worked so beautifully. And uh, I was lucky to be on the B team for that. So when um, usually it was Damien Farrell, Dave Chapman, and Warwick Brownlow Pike. But if Legends. I know, yeah. <laughs> and if uh, Warwick and Dave. Uh, were on other characters that was featured then Lynn and I were stepping in to do it um and again that was a real kind of pleasure to do something that you know was that kind of pure puppetry yeah in, was uh was really special you know that's the kind of stuff that I'd done in my theater world the rod puppetry stuff yeah um, certainly with the little angel so um that was something that I jumped on that was really my jam you know I bet yeah. And what a cool looking character too. Just like oh. rocks held together. Like what a cool design. Stunning. So good. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. There's just so much to love. And the the universe of it, again, there's just so much room for expansion. And... Yeah. And just the, the sheer Brian Froud. Yeah. It's like the eye of how they, it's very clear who, like if you see a Norman Rockwell painting or like a specific artist painting, it's so mm. ingrained in the way their brain works. Dark Crystal is just... one of those things that just, Oh, got it. Got it. This is the mental yeah. stamp of this artist. And yes, you need just, just a tiny bit of it, don't you, to know yeah. that, that that's, their, that's their aesthetic. That's, yeah. that's the visual language. And actually, the visual mythology yes. is so strong. Um, you look at those things and it tells you the history of the whole world just by yeah. looking at a couple of lines on a page. I find that with... Um, uh, in Star Wars as well. Um, yeah. When we we were shooting in Jordan on a scene with the Aki Aki, um, yeah. who were these incredibly designed aliens with really long, yeah, yeah, they're really yeah. long tentacles. And looking at them on location in those costumes with the things they had, you know, the stools and things and the props, you just go, ha this is incredible. Like the production design here, the it tells me everything about these people. Yeah. In a glance. And that is such a skill. That is such a skill. It is. It's like, oh, this is this is real. They just live yeah. here. Oh hi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Cool. Oh, they must have been here the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad yeah. we got them on the They're movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. How nice of them. <laughs> yeah. So through Dark Crystal, is that how you got to work with Voxen? <laughs> oh, so Do I know yeah. stuff, Claire? Yeah. Did I see the music video where you made a panorama? Maybe I did. <laughs> Maybe I did. <laughs> Maybe you did, yeah. <laughs> I loved making that video, you know. Um, I bet. So I met Becky on on mm -hmm. Becky Henderson on Solo. Oh, I didn't know she worked on Solo. Interesting. <laughs> so, you know, uh, okay. the scene that we were talking about, the Mother Proxima stuff, where everyone yes. in the UK was in puppeteering a tentacle. Right. So was Becky. Interesting. Uh, okay. Yeah, and I right. actually met. You know, a good few of us met on that. Like, I think the more people you talk to, you know, the more yeah. you are, the more you just check whether they were there on yeah. the tentacle. Um, what does Proxima because... mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> it means everything. That's where we all met. Done. Um, but yeah, I met Becky there very briefly. Um, and then uh, obviously on Dark Crystal. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't get to work together on a puppet on Dark Crystal. Mm -hmm. Because you know we were in own different worlds. A lot of sure. for a lot of it felt like completely different jobs. You know. Sure. Um, she's deep. She's, she's deep. She's got a lot of work to do. <laughs> she's 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 got her hands full. Just a yeah. little bit. <laughs> um, and then on Dark Crystal, we got talking about her band, and obviously with my interest in music as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then she discovered one day that I was a bit of a builder. Um, and I, my background was from, you know, I started building puppets and making theatre shows. Yeah. She got excited about that. Um, Rightfully so. 
<laughs> and so <laughs> we decided to collaborate on a project and that was the sanctuary music video um cool. yeah um and their thing the thing that we were trying to kind of nail was the kind of contemporary music and an older visual mm -hmm. um and cranky boxes are something that i've been really interested in for a while um just because i'm you know i'm that nerd that has all the books why and all not? the old things in you know i respect it yeah yeah and you, well, you never know when you're gonna need to make a cranky box i've always know? said this <laughs> it means that something different over here but <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a whole different interview you know um yeah <laughs> uh and yeah so i suggested look let's look at a really old fashioned way of telling this again let's see if we can juxtapose that you know your musical style with some kind of older visual style yeah um and i'm really into illustration because why not because uh -huh. yes, why uh, not i've seen your drawings they are not? awesome oh, thanks very much um so yeah, it was a nice way of kind of again combining the puppetry stuff and the illustration interests and the musical interests. Um, and shadows is something that over so I had three months of the lockdown mm -hmm. um in 2020 and then I ended up going back to work. But in those three months, I um ended up teaching myself how to shoot and edit. Dude, um <laughs> you're a machine and I love it. <laughs> it's that old have a go actually, that's right um you gotta try the thing uh and i started experimenting with shadow puppetry and shadow puppetry again is something that i just adore the simplicity yes of the way that you can tell a story with shadow Agreed. puppetry is just something that I, I just could not try um so i added that to the mix with the vox and vid um cool. And they loved it. Yeah, they loved the concept, so we ran with it. Um, and, yeah, it's a, it's such an important story as well, you know. Yeah. It's trials and the invisible women of those days. I just mm -hmm. think it's, um, it all just kind of married really well together. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's really cool. <laughs> Thank it, you. How, how does it work? Because there's, there's not, like, a 50-foot circular piece of paper that's going through. Like, how – I'm looking no, at it and I see it. How does it work? What am I looking at? So it's just one scrolling panorama. So it looks like it's kind of probably about this tall maybe. Uh -huh. And then the bottom is bigger. Right. Um, and it's one big roll of paper. And okay. then that's it. And then you slide it on one side. So right. the furthest side. And then you sort of unravel it and attach it to one of the uprights on the other okay. side. And then crank that one. And then the whole thing unravels. And then it rolls onto the other side. Got it. So it's one roll that completely goes onto the other side. Okay. Um, and then you have a light source behind it. So you've got illustration on the front, mm -hmm. which is lit. We sort of light from the front. Uh, and then you have the brighter to the light from behind. Um, and you can puppeteer in the in that light to create your shadows from behind. Oh. So the words that are on this on the paper are actually on the paper. And then all the yeah. other stuff with shadow puppets you timed in between. That's cool. How That's many right. tries did that take to get the timing right? <laughs> <You're awesome. Yeah. laughs> I saw so, in your yeah. eyes. <laughs> you saw the fear flicker in. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the real story is we we slowed the track down. That is genius. That makes like sense. Fifty percent, so that we could cram in as much as possible. See, there's no way you um, can do it regular. We're human beings. Uh, <laughs> and also, I had some help as well. So I got um. <laughs> My dear friend, uh, Dominic Cray, who has been coming along with my harebrained schemes. Amazing. For as long, for as we long all as need I a co-pilot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then Annie Brooks, who's another fantastic puppeteer, who I met doing uh, theatre work years and years ago. And we yeah. collaborate um, as much as we can. And she's a fantastic maker as well. She has a really similar style to me, actually. So we often cool. kind of throw each other work or share projects as well over the years. Um, yeah. Yeah, she was a great ally to have on that too. So we slowed it down and then we could kind of cram in a load more. Um, uh, okay, okay. But, uh, but that track in my mind is really slow. And then when I hear it, oh, really, oh my God, <laughs> so fast. It's like a rave track now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got, what speed is this going? Oh, the, oh. Yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> fine. Okay. <laughs> but also it was a nice juxtaposition because I did that 
I was sort of making the ideas for that and sort of teaching myself shadow puppetry uh-huh. in that first lockdown. And then it was like a couple of Halloweens later, I made the video. But I taught myself the shadow puppetry stuff and all the delicate handmade stuff in those three months. And then I went to puppeteer big dinosaurs. I was <laughs> about to away. say, if this is the during the lockdown, this is right around Jurassic World Dominion picks up right after. That's right. Yeah. Um, how how was that? It's I dinosaurs. Mean, it's dino time yeah it's pretty cool it is really cool and actually watching jurassic park as a tiny child was again one of the reasons why i wanted to do the this job now yeah i feel like that came back around was just you know something special and i was always a massive dilophosaurus fan I was like, oh, oh it's dil- good one dilophosaurus, yeah 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 and i in i get a phone call i'm working on um i was directing some puppetry on a theater show in london and uh, i get a phone call from derek arnold um i've heard of him mutual... yeah <laughs> that guy yeah. Yeah, he's all right <laughs> yeah, he's fine uh and he says hey claire and i was like yeah he said i've got Spot a job on impression <laughs> <laughs> he said i've got a job you're gonna want to do and i was like oh cool well tell me when he's like next week and I said okay well I, I can't do next week and I remember <laughs> saying to him but if it's what I think it is please ring me back please ring me back um and he did he so did. you know he that, did. Was, uh, that was great and then the first day I walk in there's a can you come and you know have a have a look at this and it's a Dilophosaurus and then it gets that another moment where you go oh I just need to my throat's a bit dry. Hang on, I just need to <laughs> pretend to get something out of my bag and then come back. <laughs> you gotta do what you um, gotta do. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. And I feel like everybody does it. You everybody. have to. If you don't, I don't trust you. It's that's yes, my exactly. litmus test. Yeah. Yeah, you don't deserve to be here if you're not. If on you the can edge look at a dinosaur oh. with a dry eye, yes. I want nothing to do with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true so true if you're not as big a nerd as me about dinos yeah get out get out we don't need you Um, here (laughs) so yeah so that was um yeah jurassic was quite an experience and of course doing it in the pandemic was um was wild I bet different world. Really wild. Yeah, yeah. A Jurassic world. A Jurassic <laughs> world. <laughs> I knew I liked you, Claire. Yeah, but yeah, it was amazing, and and the teams. I mean, the teams are always amazing. Like everyone yeah. on the crews are always amazing because you're all just working and working and pushing for that same end. But mm-hmm. it was something else to watch people pull together during that time and kind oh, of bet. get make the thing. Um, yeah, and the level of support as well people were showing to each other was was brilliant, and the kindness and you know the the things you need to do your job were provided for you. You know, if you need X, Y, Z, then you know, just people going above and beyond. Like, yeah, um, and of course that pulls teams tighter together as well. So actually, you know, if you've got a shorthand of someone in our team, we're suddenly even kind of even tighter because the shorthand is even shorter. Um, right, and. Uh, Derek and Derek Arnold and Damien Farrell, mm-hmm. who are puppet captaining that job, just did an incredible job. And John Nolan's team, oh. just everyone in the, again, again, it's this thing of people working at the top of their art, and not only working at the top of their art, but during a global pandemic as well. Like, yeah, incredible, unprecedented just, times. Yeah, yeah, as they say, yes, as they um, say, yeah, that's yeah, wild. Do you do you still get nervous? Because you're in this pool of like people at their apex, but also you you've been killing it for a long time as well. Like you, you know, I it's that it's that perform me thing. You know, I think you see the thing and you do your best with the thing, and that's all you can ever do. Sure. Um, I am not. I'm not a very. I'm a bit. I'm a bit unflappable. I'd say I'm not very a, a flappable. Good. <laughs> but there are moments where you go oh wow this is a, this, you know this is a big deal sometimes you catch yourself I get it less less often now but sure certainly in those early days when we were talking about the uh Luleo Primoc in the jar for right for some, and it's just you know it's my first thing on my own sure you know, Amber, um you get it then absolutely and also in your brain goes through 
they're spending millions of pounds here. Yeah. <laughs> for me, uh-huh. for me to to do it right. That that's right. that's going on there, you know. But um I think the old like performance training sort of kicks in and you, you can sure. kind of manage that stress level or manage that and kind of put on your big resilience pants and kind of go, Yeah, I've got this. Sure. That's okay. And I think the dream is always in the team as well. Like if you feel like you're supported of and course. your whole team are, are all pushing for the same ends, then yeah, you tend to not get nervous, I think, eventually. Sure. That you sort of work through. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Mm. But you can use nerves in a really good way as well, you know. Like, totally. I agree. As you know, like acting, you can, <laughs> you know, you harness that and make it something, yeah. make it into a useful energy. Right. I totally agree. Mm. How did how did you end up doing Moz? Because I've seen you connected with like <laughs> stuff with like a real Moz yeah. Kanata, and you're like, it's uh, explain this to me. I've seen cables attached. It's like she's puppeteering you almost, but you're puppeteering her. Yeah, you see me plugged in. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the Moz story for me is again, it's a real funny cyclical one. Sure. Because. That first thing that I was interviewed for, that Brian Herring rang me for all those years ago, yeah, actually was for Maz when she was going to be a puppet. Oh. And then she became CG and Lupita did the capture for her. Right. And then it all came all the way back around to being a puppet. Um, and interesting. Yeah, isn't that interesting? So that was the first thing I auditioned for and it was the last thing I did in the in Rise of Sky. Yeah. So that kind of feels like a little magic circle somehow. Um, I love it. But yeah, I ended up doing that. So I, I was working on Dark Crystal and I was asked to add a call from uh, Neil Scanlon. Oh, amazing. Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the team there. And there were a couple of things that they had lined up that they wanted me to do. But they also, one of them was the mass stuff. Cool. Um, so I obviously say, yes, I'd love to do whatever it is that you'd like me to do because they're all fantastic. Because yes. Because um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> always yes. Yeah um and then so I turn up to uh try mask for the first time and it's a data suit so I wear the data suit okay. I have uh you've probably seen on the pictures there's lots of wires coming up but you have like uh I have gloves I have yep. cuffs on my arms I have a vest on so there's a sensor on my chest on my stomach on my back uh on my shoulders I've also got a headband on with sensors uh-huh. all across here as well um so it's the whole body is captured, the whole upper body. Oh. Um, and that the data suit drives the puppet, essentially. And what that means okay. is I don't have to be next to the, the puppet on the set. So sure. the puppet can be in the scene. And then we run everything, all the cables out, and we can be right next to JJ so that she becomes a completely directable character within the scene. Huh. Amazing, hey! And then we have um, Matt Denton on the eyes and the frown and like the Legend. upper part of her face. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the tech that they have there um, and that he's the software that he's created is just amazing. Um, yeah. Then Richard Coombs on the oh, great. and the dialogue on set uh, and the lower part of the face. Um, so that you know we're all working together again to push to that kind of really directable character on yeah. set, and of course. If and if we're not right next to it, I mean, how fantastic for the cast to oh, yeah. have <laughs> living, breathing mass just just there next to them. Yeah. Um, and of course, we had a lot of scenes where um, lots of scenes with uh, Leia in as well. So there's right. lots of stuff as and Leia. Mm-hmm. Um, and so to have her there just meant that that scene could be just as intimate as intended. You know, and those scenes yeah. where in the cave and on the base can mm. be not surrounded by loads of puppeteers and we just have the character yeah. in there performing just as as a living breathing creature with everybody else alongside just again a, in, incredible stuff and we're we you know we run all the cables out and we sit up outside the set and i work with we work with monitors and i have two of them depending on where my eye line is because of course i have to do whatever she's doing oh right have have my monitors sort of all over the place um to be able to see physically see what what she's doing um, yeah and, and like 
her level of movement just for i mean if, you, if you've seen the picture you'll see that yeah i don't have that many sensors on me at all really right. um but how she's able to mimic the detail is something else like i move my hands all my uh -huh. fingers i have control of all the fingers on her and she would do exactly you know it does exactly Whoa. The same. um the craftsmanship and the just the attention to detail i mean even down to the painting which was um uh the, t the team there on the painting uh it was henrik um there were gold flecks on her skin oh, and wow being just stunning i looked at her obviously on a monitor yeah of course <laughs> you got you got to get into the mindset you, you start are to know these things and you appreciate these things you know and, yeah uh, and then of course we were because you already existed as a cgi creation in, right. in the world we're then looking back at all the footage that exists of her already, mm -hmm. um, the performances by Lupita and Artie Shah as well. So Artie Shah oh, was, amazing. The, was the sort of body performer as well on uh, Force Awakens. Mm -hmm. So we're looking back at all that because it's so different to creating a new character when you're she's already there. So we then look sure. back at what's come before to try and match it and then also to look at how we advance it because where is she at, at that point in this story, how, you know, what, sure. what could have what could have changed for us now with her um, right um yeah that was yeah that was great fun actually that was a really great character to get stuck into that's so nuts i was wondering mm -hmm. how sensitive it is because like the just to see the technology from seven from the creature perspective to like solo oh. with six eyes is like you guys are it creating like things that's not it yeah yeah like how do you know, it's funny you say about six eyes because I was, um, so I was around that table. I was directly opposite um, Derek in, in oh, six were you? eyes. I, yeah, I was over on uh, Therm Scissor Punch. Oh, know? of course. The lobster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With Lynn, uh, Andy Heath, Yestin, Evans, Dude. and Stu uh, Beatty. Yeah, yeah, we were all over there. But I was sat opposite um, six eyes. And so every now and then in between takes, I just look up and just stare at it. Because <laughs> it's just incredible. He yeah. looks he looks like he's CGI. You look at him in the real world with your yeah. own human eyes and yeah. your brain says, Oh, that looks like CGI. I mean, it's unreal. It had an incredible um uh bit of programming that um I think Matt Denton's behind, uh, mm -hmm. where the eyes kind of they have a little bit of like residual movement. So when Derek's moving his head, the yes. eye still have that sort of little bit of life in them and respond to what he's doing almost like gimbal tech i guess is yeah um yeah it's, it's just something else and tech the tech moves so fast is the other yeah. thing but, you know we have that tech for maz on rise of skywalker who knows what they're going to come up with next for the, I'm thinking for... the same thing <laughs> I know. And, uh, it's just mind-blowing just mind-blowing what a time um, to be alive yeah for sure and to to Go in and even be a tiny part of that is something that I don't think I'll ever get over. Yeah. Always remember not to take for granted because it's just magic what the people are creating there. Magic. Agreed. Do you find that the technology is making your job easier in some ways? Or you also have to learn to use it as well. So does it even yeah. help? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think so. I think the way they work best is when they complement each other. Yeah. Uh, I love the mixture of the practical and the VFX stuff, because obviously you look back to the nineties and you, you can kind of see the tech uh, mm -hmm. was being pushed and pushed and pushed. Uh, and mm -hmm. the tech was being kind of, let's see how far it can go and see how right. far it can place things and how far it can push. And we found the limits, you know, right. that seems to happen. But now I think it's just sort of across the industry, it's more appreciated that those things sit so beautifully together. I mean, you only need to look at some of the stuff in Dark Crystal or Jurassic or Star Wars or any mm -hmm. of the things we've been talking about to kind of appreciate that the two go hand in hand. And certainly with the Maz stuff as well, you know, we only had an upper body. So we are kind of, I'm moving her to create, you know, the, the sensation that, she, the uh, illusion, sorry, that she exists from the floor up. Right. Um, and when that, information that all goes over to ILM obviously they already have her as digital property so they sure. can replace little bits and pieces according to there was lots of um uh the dialogue um mm -hmm. some dialogue changes and things so they can replace the mouth or like they can replace whatever they need to sure. um and they have that basis of the practical performance under there just to give it that little bit of of something real you know it gives yeah. it that beat you were saying earlier on in our chat it gives it 
that realism. Um, and I love seeing it when those two things sit together yeah. and marry so and it, it you know, and your brain doesn't go, oh, that feels weird. Right, um, yeah. <laughs> you're seeing so much more now where it just is just one hundred percent believable. It's unreal. I agree. Do you have any advice for people that want to be puppeteers today because the landscape is so different and rapidly changing? That's a really good question. I think it's less about the tech and more about stuff like getting good at doing the thing Sure, will open doors for you. Like I think that's probably the a bit of useful intel. Um, yeah. And not being afraid to have a go at it, no matter what that is, you know, whether that's something that's really practical, whether that's something that does involve some sort of tech for you. Um, yeah. But yeah, getting good at the thing and having access. I think access to the things is is quite difficult mm. for a lot of people. You know, I came up through theatre and was lucky to kind of carve a way into what I'm doing now. But mm -hmm. it is, you know, the, the entertainment industry is hard to to get into yeah. you know and it is it's a slog I think um but I think the thing that serves me the best is trying to just keep doing keep doing the thing yeah <laughs> the thing. keep getting better but, yeah yeah I think so because nobody's gonna offer you a job on a film if you're not willing to put the work in you know or like yeah. I think it's all about is it about blind belief that you can do it? I think it is. <laughs> a little bit about that. Maybe it is. But also remember to pay your bills and stuff. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> also look after your mental health because yeah. that's important. I think, um, yes. I think you're right. <laughs> waffle, waffle. You know. <laughs> and then I, I am personally curious. What is your favorite bottle in your collection? I know. I know, Claire. Look at this. Oh. Um, didn't think I'd know, did you? I didn't think you'd know about that yet. So it came, my in, little... it came in my house, Claire. <laughs> He's not realizing. I love that Kubo is in the background there, by I the know, way. I know, my little boy. No. Look at him. Hey, buddy. So hey, handsome. buddy. So <laughs> playing for the camera now. Yeah. <laughs> um, my favorite ball, I mean, any of the little poison balls. I've got a really teeny tiny little green. Yeah. Little green situation yeah. uh, that... Uh, I think I found in a junk shop in Greenwich when I used to live in London. Um, cool. He's pretty great. Gets a lot of attention. A lot of Rightly great press. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I always feel like they're being a bit wasted just on my shelf. But someone will someone will come in my house and, and be excited about it and prove me wrong. So, Boom. Yeah. My <laughs> right? I'm excited about it. That counts. Hooray! <laughs> well, just like that, Claire, we've been talking for over an hour. You survived. Amazing. I'm still here. Look so did you. you. This was amazing. I I knew this was going to be fun. Oh, it's been but, so nice oh, chatting to you. You are a gem. So, oh, well, it's been a long time coming, you know. It has. And I'm I'm glad. I'm glad because we had to build up the stories and the rapport. You know what I mean? Yeah, it would have yeah, been too did. early. Who knows yeah. what would happen? Well, it was 2020. So indeed, who knows what That's would That's true. Yeah. We had to survive that first before we yes, survived we each other's company. Yeah. And we've done both. So well done us. Yeah. we've Well, look at us. <laughs> High five. So... <laughs> Before I let you go, though, I got to ask, where can mm. people find your stuff? Where can they find you online? Talk to me. Uh, so I am mostly on Instagram these days, actually. It's just such a nice visual medium, isn't it? Agreed. Uh, you can find I like it. Roy Harvey. That's just my full name. And uh, I do have a website as well, uh, which is claireroyharvey.com. But yeah, uh, I'm also on Twitter, I think, as well. But you'll mostly catch me on Instagram. Come yeah. over there. Yeah. Good. Have a go. Yeah, why not? Try it. Learn it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter and Instagram. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. There you'll find my demos, short films, and a bunch of other really fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, 
please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to pick you up some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly and get early releases of the show, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Daryl, Daz, Ben, and Chris. Your support means so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.